you know, in, in relation to like um, the culture and the vision and the, and the setting that vision and the strategy. So what sort of things do you, you know, do you, well, I suppose, first of all, do you find that mats, um, all mats have that already? Or do you find now that HE still go in and there's, there's a need to basically sort of support them in, in, in creating that sort of vision and strategy and, uh, and uh, giving them some tools to basically help them drive that strategy down as well? See that again. I mean, that, I love that question because I'm having this conversation at the moment with with, with a group of multi academy trusts that are looking at merging. And when you actually ask them why are you doing it, and you don't get the answers back that you expect to get because they've done the thought processes before. And then if I ask every school in the country what your ethos is. I would probably expect to get the same ethos back across all 20 or thousand schools. So we want well-rounded, polite children who get access to this. We want to provide them with it in a safe environment. who will turn out to be respectful, polite, for young people, et cetera. And then it's the same, yeah. which effectively we should have all the same schools there because the ethos is the same. And then what happens then is they all have their own ethos and then when they come together, all they do is they join key words, buzzwords out of everyone's ethos or mission statement or visions and then they create an overarching one and where it potentially go, go, falls down Nick is that they, it, they create it and then it's never seen again and never discussed it, and it's never then actually challenged across the, everything that we do have we actually hit this Yeah, because they create it and they park it, it doesn't become integrated into their daily lives it's not an it's not a thing that is integrated into their DNA. They choose the, their ethos because they have to have one. They, they choose their mission statement because they feel they have to have one. But is it truly used to actually develop and, uh, the trust on a trust development plan and, and, and match it with the school development plan? Possibly. Always. Possibly not. Yep. So, that, so that culture, what we do is we, we try and take them back to say, You've asked us for this activity. Let's stop. Let's take a step. let's take a breath. Let's go backwards. Let's start on a blank piece of paper. Let's have a look at the why. Why are you trying to do it? What are you trying to achieve? Let's get it right. Let's sort this plan out. Let's get the right people around the right table with the right skill sets to make the right decisions. And then we'll talk about what the what is. And that could be this. It could be that. It could be a legal document. It could be you know, a new finance system. It doesn't matter what it is. But let's go backwards. Because it, the, the, the mentality is always, this is our ethos, mm. and it doesn't join up with this activity that we currently want to do. This activity we currently want to do, how does that impact on all the other activities that we've got? Well, we've not even thought about that. And those trusts that do think, if we're going to implement this, how is it going to impact on that? will solve problems far quicker. I agree. I think it adds more focus, doesn't it? It comes back to, and obviously, I love the I love the why bit because that's something we we talk about a lot with businesses, let alone necessarily, and which obviously mats are, but less less so. We we, we know we we talk less so to mats than you do, but you know, absolutely, you know, the why fact, you know, the why you're in this market, you know, the what what why, you know, why do you care, you know, is that sort of type of you know, what's important to you, what's your why, um, yeah. what people should be buy into you is is really really important. And, and actually, you know, if, if it, it adds focus when you create strategy from that vision, that why, because it means that, you know, everything you do should be around those pillars. And if, if they don't, then you should potentially not be doing them unless you've got your pillars wrong. But, that, you know, and that's all right. You can really look at those. But yeah, I quite like the idea that you, you know, you, that you go down from that sort of why down to like strategy and everything needs to fit in. Uh, and, and we've got to consider everything, not just things. So, so we talk about we talk about the people getting it right. We talk about the infrastructure. We talk about the mindset. We talk about the processes, and we talk about the systems. And what we say is, if you want some uh, some work doing or or an activity, or you want to change something or improve something, we're not going to take one of those in isolation. What we're going to do is look at them all, because you know, with this old adage, and it is twee, but you know, you're as strong as the weakest link. But ultimately. If your mindset is wrong, then all the others are going to be wrong at some future point. Yeah. If your infrastructure is wrong, you're going to make some issues along the line, even if the other things are okay. So by going back to then challenge that thinking to say, don't always look at the, the what's in, immediately in front of you that you want to change or you want to build. 
let's take a breather, backward step, let's look around and then start saying, if we do this, what's the impact there? Let's build it properly rather than actually amending it and fixing it down the line. Let's build it robustly now. And, and our biggest job sometimes is managing expectations about speed of process. Mm. When we say, well, hang on, you, we, we, we want a merger, Jeff. Well, let's not talk about the merger until we actually talk about why you, what you're trying to achieve and why you're doing it. Let's get that out of the way first. Because the ultimate thing is, the final bit, is a few legal documents that we've got to do for you to actually get you into a merger. But before then, let's sort all the issues out so they don't come back to haunt you. Again, very, you know, very easy to equate that to businesses as well, which obviously mats are, again, mats are effectively businesses. But yeah, it's, it's interesting. The same challenges can happen through, throughout. Um, in because obviously, <clears throat> obviously a big chunk of the audience is ed tech businesses that will be talking. You know, if you were going to give them some um, of your views and advice and and wisdom, points of wisdom, in the sense of you know you work with Matt all, all the time, and 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 obviously you help them at, at basically navigate around. You know the 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 ed tech they might need to use, the services they might need to use. And obviously you must come across some good practice and bad practice in, in the sense of, you know, you must sometimes want to go, God, you've got a brilliant solution, but you're just not really, you know, you're, ultimately you're not, you're not talking in the right language to these mats or, or you. Yeah, what, what, what sort of things would you, would you suggest are good practices from some of these ed tech companies? What do you think are bad? So, so I always think that ed tech companies, are, as, as I said earlier, are massively innovative and you've got some fantastic products and the training is usually superb. But ultimately, everything that happens in a school, it comes down to people. Mm. There are good people and there are not so good people. There are great people in schools. There are some people in schools who will fail a school. There are some people in maths who will succeed and there's some that will fail it. There are some people in local authorities that will succeed the authority and some will fail the authority. But it's the same for business, as you just said, Nick. We've got good people who will succeed, businesses, and we've got some, some not so good people who will potentially harm. And you can have all of the fan, most fantastic innovative kit in a school or in a business or in a mat. But if, the, if, the, if we've not touched the people element, we're going to have a gap. So my, for me, where I see superbly fantastic ed tech solutions, and what they're not doing is they're not touching anywhere near the strategic element who are the decision makers to say why the, why this product is fantastic and, and, and what do trustees get out of it or governors, what can they do to this piece of kit? I, I ask that, uh, maybe because of the job that I do, but if I've got a new piece of ed tech coming in, I want to know as a trustee, how, how can I get my hands on that to understand my school better, to make better, far better improved de uh, de decisions for improved outcomes? And I think sometimes the EdTech market, they, they focus on the central and the finance team or the head teacher or the, the business manager and say, we've got a fantastic solution and it's great, but it's only great if it's used properly. Yeah. And if we can hit, if EdTech can, can hit as well as they do the operational side, the strategic side, then they will create a partnership with that school or map for many years to come because you become a partner rather than a, a, a solutions-based support company. You will become an, a, an organic, living breathing, living, living, breathing organic partner of that map because you're not only talking about operational sides, you're talking to the strategic decision makers as to why the operational side is right or why it needs this. And I think if, if EdTech are missing something, it's the connection to the people who are not the operational people. Yep. I, I, I fully agree. I think there's there's sometimes this whole idea, like with SaaS, you go, well, it's low touch. And it's like, you, 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 can't, you can't think in those terms. You've got to think about your customer base and potentially, you know, think about their personas. How busy are they? You know, how much time have they got to basically solve the problem of how to use your solution in the best way and get the most benefit from it? You know, how yeah. much money are they willing to spend on this? And, and, and so, you know, you have to basically think about all those elements. And then, like you say, you know, you need to basically hold the hand sometimes because they might not be very IT literate. You know, sometimes, you know, you, you might need to actually support them in the sense of you know, how they're going to go through the, the business process that they're, they're trying to achieve. Yeah, you're right. You have to you have to take every single customer almost as an individual 
and then say, right, you know, how can we best support you to make sure that you get the most out of this solution? Because if you do, the more likely you're embedded in. And secondly, you know, how do you, you know, how, how you know, what, what does that mean to us as a business, but what does, what does it mean to them as a map? And I think actually, in, interesting enough, the COVID thing is, has sort of supported that in the, in the sense of like, we've had loads of learning tools. And at the beginning yeah. of COVID, you know, I think it was school zone who said 84% of teachers were still sending stuff home by email where now, you know, I talked to, to Rowe, Rowena and she was just saying, you know, she went into a school where there's some kids still at home because they were, you know, isolating. There was kids in the classroom and they were basically, they, you could see monitor, you had a monitor for each one almost, you know, you can see the kids obviously in the classroom, but you, you know, and she said, it'd be brilliant because when, you know, kids go to hospital for some reason, they can still learn because they can still take their iPad and start, you know, be <laughs> part of the, of the class. Brilliant. So, so I think they're now embracing, you know, if you, if you can show what the outcome, the positive outcome of EdTech, then I think it's amazing, you know, what you can achieve. I, I think that's, that's brilliant because my, my, my perception dealing with schools is that EdTech companies don't necessarily come across as um, a, a partner. Mm. It, it, they tend to, to come across as a, a constant support system for, for, for systems and processes uh, and for new for new things that might crop up. But then some schools will think, well, what's the next thing? Because we're probably operating six months behind what someone else is developing. Um, but I don't necessarily think that all their tech companies come up, present as a partner um, and an organic long-term partner that's not just centered around one particular um, activity or action or one particular aspect of the, the, the overall. And I think if, 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 if you can actually spot the individual needs of the schools or even individual needs of children, and then that filters up to all of the people and the people, are, the decision makers are appreciating that and understanding that, it's far more um, uh, possible that you'll have a long-term relationship with that man as a strategic partner. We talk about a family of, uh, of, of partners. We, we, we say if you, if you join our circle, the school joins our circle, it's very rare that you'll ever have to leave. Because what we'll do is we will always provide everything that you need in our part, in our family of, of, of companies. Uh, and whether it be a personal or whether it be an ed tech, whether it be um, uh, learning, whether it be finance, whether it be a piece of IT, what we say is in our family of company, our group of family companies, we will always be able to solve your solution. And we become speed dial number one because we become that, that, that immediate fixer, that, that partner. And sometimes I, I do think that, that tech companies have got the ability to do it, but they just miss a trick about being that strategic partner because the, 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 they miss dealing with the, all of the right strategic decision makers because they're dealing with a few people who are on the central team or in the office or a teacher or a head. And then that, it, that message doesn't necessarily get filtered upwards to the trustee or the governing board. And I think if we can ensure that we, we fill that gap, EdTech companies can be seen as a, a true partner, long-term partner of they'll never need to leave your group. Yeah, it's it, that, that, that absolutely totally agree. And I, and I think actually in some ways, I think this is why um, that there's a lot of consolidation happening in EdTech technically. Also, like when with the support services, you know, they're all looking now. Well, not all of them, but there definitely are some. You know, you, you've mentioned Mark and Tadman from SBS, and and I think they are looking at their overall proposition now and saying, you know, is there more that we need to expand upon to deliver a single, you know, we will be your single managed service sort of type approach. And I, I think it's quite interesting. I think you're right. I think you know it's the same with 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 ed tech from a technical perspective you know what is going to be your overall proposition you know how are you going to make sure that you know they can come to you and say you know this, this is the part of your partnership that we can help and support you on you know what, what you know what do you need and i think you can even split it down into the sectors of, of, of education you can look at the primary sector and the, and the primary sector by and large has longer term relationships with with support companies and providers than that may be a, a secondary who may have or certainly a map, you may have a chief operating officer, a chief finance officer, a CEO. They may have a, a massive back office admin function. Mm. Uh, someone may be tasked to actually go and find in the best of everything on a yearly basis. 
Uh, and in primary schools, they may not have that. So relationships can tend to be longer in the primary sector. But but I do think that, you know, uh, and people like Mark, you know, Mark, Mark uh, they have a family of companies. They, they provide different things. They go out and they talk to other companies like Howard does. Um, because once you're actually working collaboratively, you miss, you never you never find a gap. Because we're, our, our job ends there, your job starts there. But what happens if a school sat here? Who's going to fill that void? So if we overlap what we do as a collaboration of, of, of companies, then we can always provide everything that a school needs to take away some of the hurt and the, some of the decision making so they can concentrate on those little people about giving the best to those children, knowing full well that they've got the support network here. Yeah. And I think if it, it's, the, it's the message that edtech companies uh, can put out there, because if, if, if it's not coming to the strategic decision makers, it's going into school, unless it's filtered upwards, as I say, then the trustees or the GB may never hear about how good that edtech company is. And then you may have a skill set on the GB or the trust board who then says, well, actually, we could use this in a different area as well, a different, a different way. Such as how it's evaluated, we can use that in a different, a different manner. So why would we not have this product, and why would we not have this long-term relationship with this company? Yeah, yeah, you, you, you definitely. And also, if you if you if you're actually only in the school, then you can easily be replaced. You know, if the, if the Matt doesn't understand who you are, you know, then you know it doesn't it doesn't <coughs> take um, uh, any sort of um, a genius to understand. Uh, obviously, you know, as a Matt, you may decide to consolidate all your solutions or your systems, uh, and your system might not be part of that consideration. Uh, and Nick, to be fair, technology, I mean, uh, I'm not in tech, but technology for me is always moving forward. Mm. It's always looking at the next thing. It never stays still. But the one constant in schools is people. That it, it, We will always have the people who are the decision makers, whether the tech speeds off uh, a way ahead of our capabilities and understanding yeah but the constant will be people so having that balance of uh, dealing with if an edtech company speaks to me I, I, i'm a technical luddite but but i'm a decision maker i'm a, I'm a major decision maker in my trust yeah so if, if, they, if they give me the message that works for me i am more than likely to actually play ball and deal with that company as a true strategic partner then I'm just thinking all they provide is that and, and we can get someone in the school who may be leaving next year. Someone else may come in and say, well, I've got seen a different system. I want that. Yeah, go and do it. That, that, there could be a detached and not a joined up approach that may harm the school if we're not involving all the people. 